Yeah. It's okay. raining, clearly. But um, using a Mac is basically like using Emacs. If you can't work out what to do, what you do is you hold down Magnum <laughs> and, and, and eventually happens. something happens, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this whole point is, and, and I apologize in advance, I was putting a lot of this together in the last couple of days, and there are dozens of really good puns that I just I missed entirely. But the, the real problem is in a lot of objects, and we saw something in the last talk with that, there are a lot of times if you have an object, you can't be sure how it's used, you can't be sure where it's going to end up. You put something out there, and something you don't know fiddles with the guts of your object. You can't control where the object is going to go in the flow of your program. You might get bugs introduced into your object by someone else, and all kinds of external issues can require special handling, changes in APIs, special issues with you know, time, reuse. Apache is a classic for that. Well, you can't hit the database more than 10 times in one minute, something like that. Otherwise, you'll puke, because you'll, you'll use too many resources. The whole problem with Apache having to restart itself after so many service requests to avoid memory leaks is another example of that. Wrappers, the whole point of this is, we're all lazy. We like Perl. The point of a wrapper is that instead of hacking your object to account for everything that might ever happen to it, why don't we protect it? So, if you think of a lot of what you do to wrap an object, to protect it from access to do whatever, inside-out classes that are classic. Okay, there's a nice little wrapper. Let's store all of your stuff out here. I can make that a class. You use it. And then you don't have to rewrite that wrapper ever again. So, because this is repetitive, it makes pretty good use of, of objects. Also, the division of labor simplifies life, because once it's wrapped, your object doesn't have to check all this stuff. You don't have to rewrite those checks. Why write them more than once? And basically, when you think about an object, a wrapper, it should look like the real thing. If you've done it right, the person using your object through the wrapper should have no idea. Leaking is important. If your wrapper leaks, people are going to notice. If your object leaks out of it, if you dispatch outside the object, if you do something in the wrapper that the caller has to say, oh, wait a minute, I'm using the wrapper, I've got to call it this way instead, it didn't work. And again, some examples of these. I'm using this for reusable sanity checks, which are things like not using DBI across a fork. Other things are compatibility. Let's say you've changed your API. You change the type of the object. You uh, classic thing is you got sick of hashes and you went to a blessed reference to Scalar because it was easier to use. Fine, no harm. But you, for the people who still think they want to look at a hash, maybe you just have to write a hash-based access thing that has all the pieces in it and looks like a hash. Maybe you need to modify the context. An example of that uh, is if you have a, a hash-based object and there's a verbose flag in it. And the original version of this thing had verbose as 0 and 1. And people said, no, 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 verbose should be on or off, or it should be a bit flag or something like that. You can set all this stuff before you go in. You say local wrapped object to verbose equals decide whether I want it to be verbose right now or not. You make the call, local clears it out when you come back. The object doesn't have to change, but everything else above it gets what it needs. Another thing, too, is, and Unix device drivers work this way, you've got a top half and a bottom half. You may have policy you want to implement. So the top half says, is this a legal call? Is this a method I know about? Are you doing the right thing? The bottom half says, I've been validated. I do. It's a nice separation, and it allows you to sanity check and test it a lot more easily. So, in Perl, there's of course more than one way to do this. One thing you can do is just write a new class that overrides the methods of the old one, classic OO. Another approach is you can go into the symbol table and replace the methods. Another is you can use auto loads to redispatch as needed. Uh, examples of replacing, overriding is just about everything. But if you look at attribute handlers, you replace something in the symbol table 
with something that handles it. So the, the top half is the attribute handler. The bottom half is the code that's replaced. Object trampoline, if you've seen that one, it actually replaces the object in place while you're using it. It says, OK, you want a trampoline? Fine, until you use me on this dumb thing. Now I'm going to replace it with an object you want it. So you can actually modify the object as it goes through in a way that it's wrapped. This one uses an auto load to handle all the heavy lifting. And the itch I had was DBI with forks. And as people use DBI much, because I can save a lot of talking if you guys know it. You do, I know. Just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I, say, I said you know. DBI across forks. The pain is child exits, parent pukes. That's bad. So why forks work in DBI? Points are sure. Okay. The, the real problem is that PIDs are used to bookkeep connections on the server side. So you can't pass off that handle across. Also, the socket is a shared resource. Close the socket, it's closed for everybody. Also, a lot of servers, because they bookkeep things at the socket level, Oracle's really nasty about this, it doesn't have a notion of, a, of passing the transaction ID across the socket each time. The transaction is associated with the socket, and there can only be one transaction pending per socket. And if you start interleaving operations, you're going to fry yourself. The other thing is, of course, destroying the object kicks its parent right in the socket. You said, I, I missed a lot of puns. I apologize. There, there's a reasonable number of them in here. It's not half bad. Um, the trick to cleaning up DBA, DBH is, in, a forked pro in, the, in the child process, you have to inactivate destruction. Then you're clean. Tim put a thing into DB, the DBI module, and the DBD handlers handle this also, called inactive destroy. If you inactivate the destroy, all the side effects of closing sockets, cleaning up, releasing, on the server, with respect to the server, they don't happen. The assumption is that somebody else is still using it. If you're within the process, you have to finish all the cached kids and then disconnect. So this looks kind of like what you do to clean up a database handle. Uh, if I, I find all the kids, which I have to do anyway, if I'm in the process that started this thing, I have to inactive destroy all of them. Otherwise, I finish the kids and I disconnect the parent. Make sense? And yes, I use drunk and check notation for all this. If you want to have a variable that's a plural, you slice off the, tra the trailing vowels and put a Z on the end. Because the problem is, if you put an S, your I will insert or remove it as necessary based on the context, because we're so used to reading quickly. The Zs always look, and, and the name came because we developed it at a bar on a cocktail napkin, and it looked like all the signs on all the Czech Polish and, and Polish sausage shops that were up the street from where we were. But the Z, because it's invariably misspelling, it sounds about right. Kids. But you say it properly, but when you read it, the Z stands out in your eye and says, wait a minute, that looks pretty weird. And you realize it's either a reference or an array or something like that. So sanity checking a PID is actually pretty easy. The current process ID is always in dollar dollar, which matches the shell variable. So if I store dollar dollar at the time I create something, I can compare it to dollar dollar when I'm using that thing, and I know if I forked. End of story. But you look at this, this looks pretty standard. I'm going to do the same thing to every database handle, everywhere, every time. I've got pretty much the same idea. I want to compare the PID. I've got the same kind of stack that I have to go through to validate it on a call to validate the destroy. This sounds objective. My requirements, aside from not leaking, are this has to be fast. I'm using this in heavy-duty database processing, and I'm making lots and lots of these calls. I can't use a lot of bulky storage, because I'm, I have a lot of these things pending, and I use these wrappers for other things where I might have 10 or 20,000 of them in memory at once. And I also want to avoid unintended 
side effects. I don't want to affect the state of the database handle when I use it, which is part of the not leaking. So I built this in layers to make it a little more reusable. The basic about Damien Conway convinced me not to upload it to CPanda's object finder. So it actually is called object wrapper on, on CPAN. But it, all this provides is a generic destroy and autoload. The auto Damien suggested something practical. Oh, yes. Right, when we get outside, we need to check the skies. <laughs> no, no, no. No, he just said he, he, he suggested something that wouldn't get me in trouble. Trouble's relative. Yeah, well, the, the object for your part, also, it, not enough people understand it is the problem. I mean, one thing I was tempted is, is, is convert, translate the whole bloody thing into Australian. <laughs> all the documentation, all of everything everywhere. It, but it, again, it, Damien doesn't remember enough of it, and Nat wouldn't answer my emails on the subject. So I, I didn't have anyone that knew enough of the vulgarisms. The point is that you need an autoload on the way in that says, validate that I'm doing something reasonable, and you need a hook to the destroy that says, check that, there's a, check that I'm, I'm sanitizing myself on the way out. So really all I need is a sanity check on the predispatch. Instead of calling that out of the autoload, I decided to rewrite autoloads purely for speed. The extra, met, the extra call on the internal part to check is there a, a hook and call the hook is, is higher enough. And these autoloads are repetitive enough that they're easy to cut and paste. I need a straight jacket to clean up on failed sanity checks and in the destroy. Uh, I chose to leave that as a hook and just call it, generally because the rate at which you destroy things is much lower than the rate at which you call methods on them. So can is kind of nice, and this is where I got the structure for the object. Can returns a reference to the statement, to the actual subroutine that implements what you're asking for. So if I ask package can or I ask object can, I get a code ref back, which means I can say a handler is an object can, whatever my hook name is. And then I can call hook object to handler of hook. But remember, that's dispatched into the object into the hook as an object followed by whatever other arguments. So far, so good? Well, that gave me the structure for my, my, flying, my fryer. I just bless an array ref with the object and whatever sanity check arguments there are. At that point, I can call handler at dollar object and be done with it. So the wrapper is the arguments to the cleanup call. I don't have to discombobulate it at all. Does that make sense? Anyone wait? Do I detect a heartbeat? Of course, they can turn the music off. That would make it a little easier. But... So usually, I separate out construction and initialization. In this case, it wasn't worth the effort. Because this, this is the constructor for one of these things. Because all you do is grab an object and bless it and whatever else you were passed. If you want to construct it for use with the fork test, you pass it dollar dollar. That's it. Why are you shifting the object off rather than just doing at underscore or croak? Because um, I'm blessing dollar object and at underscore. Yeah, I could, I could use dollar underscore or zero. In general, if you're grabbing one thing off the stack, it's, it's actually faster to shift one thing than it is to expand it into something else. Um, yes, yeah, so I could have used dollar underscore or zero true and, and done that. Also, at that point, you could just blast backslash at underscore and not need it to correct that for reference. Yeah, the only problem is if I do it that way, because I've got, I end up storing references to the objects. If anything else on the, on the tail end of add underscore, I want to make copies of the arguments. I want to... Right. 
I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to cause a side effect in your land where one yeah. of my arguments is an object that's kept no, alive longer. Just go so you don't get the aliasing behavior because the aliasing behavior right. can last even through the taking the reference to that underscore. Yeah. So the object, I know I need the actual thing off the stack. I want the alias. The rest of them, I want to take, I want to take values. Okay, so now I've got it. What do I do with it? Actually, the whole point is whatever you want. This should look like a database handle. It should look like whatever you're wrapping. Uh, the object wrapper, the auto, the auto load, does nothing. And it's intended for cases where you have to be careful when you destroy something. There are, there are a lot of cases where if you're going to destroy, you want to check, is there anything outstanding? Do I have to do something? Uh, an inside-out object is the classic. You've got to strip something out of the, in, out of the hash that stores the inside-out data. So if you needed something that only said, look, my behavior is to clean up after myself, an uh, object wrapper by itself might be enough for you. And all the auto-load says is it gets a franger, it looks up the name, it says, can I do this? And it, it, just, it redispatches the thing. So the object is there, the first element of the Franger, and you go along with your life. And I could have done a go-to here, and, and mangled the stack and done a go-to, but it actually turns out to be faster to do the redispatch this way. And it, um, plus, if you alter it and just go and then go to, you'll say for the time that you No, I'm using 510 now, so. I, I occasionally get to use a Debian 3 system and they ship 584. Oh, well, my um, sympathies. I, I was intensely happy the first time I deployed a large application on there and it's that quality. Oh, that's nice for you. So, the, the Oedipus not complex that I have to create is forks. I have to make sure that uh, basically children don't screw their mothers. <laughs> and the trick here is, is just that I get the Franger off the stack, and I know I've got an object in a PID. If the PID isn't the same, I've got a problem. Puke. Now, puking is safe here because I, in the destroy, I call the cleanup. So the cleanup is handled later. All this has to do is say, if I'm not where I should be, I'm done. And I do a confess here because I want to know exactly how I got here. I want to find the, the place where that fork happened, because it might have been 14 calls ago. The parent knows I croaked, but I don't step on it. And then here I've got object to sub at underscore, which again is, is a little faster. Now, cleaning up the mess is there. It's, it's, I look up the cleanup, whatever the cleanup handler is for this thing. And I just call cleanup with that dollar franger. Whatever the arguments were, they're in the right place. And that's about as flexible as you can make it. Because you can have your cleanup be anything, and it knows whatever it passed in, those are the arguments. You so can put a cleanup what sets in active destroy. Yep. So DBI is about how you clean things up. I'll go quickly on this one. You've yeah. seen this before. You find the kids, you do the deed. Statements, um, if you're cleaning up a statement handle, there are no cached kids. So if the statement is active, if you're in the parent process, if the statement is active, finish it. Otherwise, inactive, destroy it. So if you've wrapped a statement handle, this works just fine. That's not going to work. Why? Because you're relying on the destructor. If the child process exits without the um, wrapper ever being hit, you'll go into global destruction, at which point the DBH may get destroyed before the wrapper, at which point you won't set an active destroy, you'll fuck the parent process. And if you do an exit, yeah, all bets are off. There, but if you did an exit, the wrap, even if you did an exit without the wrapper, you'd be at least as fucked. Right, but the, the, normal, the normal approach for DBH wrapping, but, um, Theory has written a thing called DBIX Connector, right. which is basically the same logic that we have in the guts of DBIX class, but as a separate module. And the way that works is basically when you retrieve the DBH, it will do the test and do the inactive destroy setting. 
that way set. You need to make sure it happens at some point during that. Right. Um, currently, you're, you're in a situation where even if, if the object gets used, yeah. um, using the object doesn't trigger any of the cleanup stuff. Yes, it does. So, no, just using it doesn't because it's the destroyer that triggers the cleanup. Right? The, no, hang on. I'm back to. Can happen out of order. No, because the, the auto load checks wherever the slide was. The auto load checks the pro, the PID. If you call any method on that DBH, at the point where you call the method, the where is it? Here we go. This auto load is going to trap every method you ever call. If you call a method and any method whatever and you are not in the, the process that created this database handle, thou shalt puke. Uh, it's just going to throw at that point. You're going to destroy yourself. Yeah. You are still going to get screwed by global destruction. Okay. Well, yes, in an exit, I didn't handle that. The exits would, would eventually do it. Yeah, but the, the point is falling, falling off the bottom of the curve. Right. Is any place to exit anything where the child process closes without the um, wrapper having already gone out of scope is going to fuck you. If you keep the wrapper alive, but the the wrapper is going to go out of scope before the DBH does, because it's got a reference to the DBH. During normal runtime, yes, global destruction, all that's off. Oh, if I do it, if I do an explicit exit, you're saying. If you do anything, if um, if the wrapper has not got out of scope of its own accord mm -hmm. before you hit the termination point of the program, right? You hit global destruction. Right. Pearl's global destruction does not walk references. Pearl's global destruction just walks the arena, destroying everything. So you have mm -hmm. no guarantee that the DBH will be destroyed later. In fact, it's quite possible because the wrapper was created after the DBH that it will get destroyed first because it's doing a linear walk through the arena. Hmm. I've never actually seen it happen that way, but I'll... Uh, yeah, I know you take a lot of that. I've yeah. seen it plenty of times. Hmm. So what are the, what are the ramifications? Uh, the ramification is if... If you do an explicit exit. No, if you, even if you fall off the end of the program. Um, if you if somebody stashes a copy of your wrapper in a variable somewhere, mm -hmm. um, you know to hang on to it for later. Right. That object is still going to be alive when you hit end of process. Right. At which point you're going to hit global destruction and get fucked. Mm. This is why um, there's a thing called double global destruction now that groups users, so that you can tell whether you're in global destruction because that way your moose destructors can test for global destruction and know they're in out of order destruction. This is one of the wonderful one. things like um, PBI's connector header, I need to share with theory about it. Um, it throws errors because it tries to talk to the DBH and its destructor. And when I use PBI's connector in my test threads, um, the destruction happens in the wrong order because it's happening in global destruction. The DBX connector tries to clean up a DBX that doesn't exist anymore. So the ramification is your your connections aren't properly terminated, and you could have well, but at that point, if you're on the server, yeah, the, the, the ramification is you can't use destroy for clean up of an object to clean up a subsidiary object, right? right. Unless you, you you are guaranteed that your thing with the destructor is going to go out of scope. The end of the right. And there's no way to guarantee that in this case? No, because all, all it takes is for somebody to stash it in a package variable or a closed lexical or something. Right. Or actually the, well, the, 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 the place this would screw you is if you fork, and in the forked process, somebody has one of these things that stays alive too long. When the forked process hits its global destruction, you can you could kick yourself in the socket. If the parent does this, it's no harm, no foul. Because the parent's going to behave, it's, it's destroying its own copy of the objects, it's destroying its own sockets, it's not going to live longer than those sockets, so who cares? Yep. But the... At least I've been lucky so far, the way I use the thing. 
Well, if you're being reasonably sensible, then this uh, year. by the time you hit the end, all of your application objects will have gone out of scope. Cool. Yeah. So if your database handles hung off the application objects, you're fine. Um, but if you, like I said, if you stash it in a globe or in a closure or something, right. which a lot of things do, um, you know, I mean, class PDI stores, it, stores a PDH as fucking class data because it's clever like that. Um, for some value, you're clever. <laughs> um, which is where I've originally seen this behavior. Okay. Yeah, then so it I was would. trying to make the bastard thing fork so. One of the many reasons why I ended up writing the wrong one instead. Mm. Well, the point of it is, in general, if you're dealing with reasonably well behaved code, this well, actually does work pretty well. It's going to work, it's just this is a caveat that you want to document. Yeah, I should, I'll point that out. Though. The, the point here then is the cleanup uh, has to check for the cache kids. So, cleanup really isn't that bad. I, I get the driver, I get the cache kids, and you've seen this before is if if I'm cleaning up what is not the PID, I have to inactive destroy them all. And then I'm done. I don't want them frying themselves. If I'm in that process, then I finish the kids and I, di di I disconnect the database handle. And in the normal case where the wrapper does go out of scope at the appropriate times and it's not left over as a global in the program. Because, yeah, the global destruction doesn't do reference counting, it just wipes things. And at that point, this would, the destroy for this wouldn't have a chance to have inactivated the thing. The other way to do it, of course, would be to just install a, install the wrapper as the destructor of the, basically you wrap the destroy in DBI so that it did this check for itself when the DBI went out of scope. Yeah, that would So, I have to think of a way to install it. I can just, what you'd have to do there is you use... DBI already has a thing called root class. You pass a root class through the DBH and have it from that as well as the relevant DBI bits. Right, so, so that would be the way to do it. Yeah, and that would be the way is you'd, you'd have to store the PID in that. You'd, 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 you'd store the PID in some spare space, and then when you hit the wrapper for the destroy of the DBH, it would check it. And that would be checked in two places, once with the DBH going out of scope and once in the other. Uh, if, you, if you're trying to be safe with generic, you need to, use, you need to check the PID as well, just in case some fuck is using threats on you. Or alternatively, you can document threads of the fork emulation on Win32, fuck off. Again, it's a caveat. Yeah. Hang thyself with thy threads. The, the, one of the tricks I want to point out here is to avoid leaks and make this thing really look like a database object. And to get the wrappers, you have to overload the constructors so that the, the person constructing things uses something that looks like DBI, which is what I did here, they're calling your class with the normal constructor and the, and the standard arguments, but they get wrappers back. So this thing, the connect, has to do a normal connect, and then it returns an object wrapper for database handle the new. And STHs return or object wrapper for STH to new. And all those do is hand back the wrapper in the appropriate, with its own correct destroy and its own auto loads. Now, this wrapper does leak for another reason that you missed. Uh, Tim Bunce, in his infinite wisdom, gave us a tied hash access to the configuration contents of a database handle, which is how you set things like inactive destroy. This is a blessed array ref. You're not going to get very far tying a hash to a blessed array ref. So at that point, uh, the point is you don't usually need that hash interface to the data. Just don't use it. But the wrapper will puke if you try and do wrapper points to curly brace, you know, inactive destroy. If you try and set those sorts of things, you're going to kill yourself. Which is a great shame since a huge amount of transaction code uses local .dbh auto commit. 
which you can also do. That's why I pointed it out here. No, I mean, you can do it on the DBHR and begin work, which is arguably better, but the only way within the DBI app to tell whether you're in a transaction mm -hmm. is to check the auto commit flag. Um, also, a lot of code checks active, the mm -hmm. active um, attribute to make sure the DBH is there. Which are other, all available through method. You can't overload hash you can't overload hashification in your wrapper to return the um, right. a wrapper, a tied wrapper around the so that's, proxy thread. That's a, a shortcoming to this. The way around it is if you really need to check those things, one of the reasons I implemented this as a simple array, you can always call wrapper to zero to whatever you want, and you can get to the database handle in one step. Yeah, that's or, you could, or you could use operator overloading and do it properly. If how am I going to overload the dehashification operator of a an array ref? Um, you do use overload percent, and it works. Okay, I never actually bothered to try overloading the types that way. Um, it, it, I mean, there's a crap example. The DBX class result set tries to behave mostly like an array ref some of the time. Yeah. So if you do apt on the result set, right. we overlay the rayification to return all of the results in the result set. Mm. And the result set is a traditional hash ref based object, and right. that's fine. The only point at which you're going to run into a problem is if somebody directly tests something like the uh, ref type using scaling meter. But if they're doing that, they're now into the you are poking the guts of somebody else's object. Yeah, yeah I, that's, that's uglier than I thought. Okay. That, that, that's, that's not so much a That's right, I've forgotten you can reify things. I so rarely have to do that, I've forgotten it even worked. So that would be the fix, is if I actually added the arrayification to this. Well, hashification. Hashification operator. I'd have to overload that. So at least I could, I could fix this one. But... The basic idea is that you can still create something that looks, for just about all purposes, like the object that you're dealing with. And it's not really very hard to wrap. Even adding, now that he pointed out, I can add the overload for the percent sign and just call, just return percent dollar, or I guess it return the DBH. And then you dereference it as is. So it's not complicated to even implement that. I so rarely use overloads. They're just too damn slow. But that would be a pretty easy way to do this. And that would give you pretty much, I guess, yeah, if I found a way to, I'd have to wrap the, the destroy for DBI in something to check the wrapper and then check the, the database handle, and then just went to the normal destroy for the database handle. And that would avoid the global destruction issue. Which is why, you know, this, this is why um, things like the uh, it's connected tend to just go, here is the object, every time you need the DBH, ask this object for the current DBH. Right. Which is, okay, it's not, it's not quite as elegant, but that it gives you what you want. That object to do whatever it needs to. Um, one, a couple of other uses for this that are kind of handy if you deal with little things like Apache. You can have objects that have a maximum time window. After this window, I want it destroyed. Just store time plus the window, and then your auto load can check time is less than the window, or to frame it a one. If you have a maximum number of uses, classic problem is there are some classes that have memory leaks in the object. They, they store too much garbage in the object. They don't clean the object up. The class itself doesn't have a memory leak. There's, it's not in global data. But you have to refresh those objects on a regular basis to avoid bloat. Put a reuse counter in here. Store the counter when you start. Decrement it. If you've used it too many times, it's dead. Throw an exception. There's another way out of that, too. Because this is wrapped, you might not want to just croak. You might want to say, you know what? I've used this object too many times. Replace it. Because people have a copy of the wrapper, there's nothing to keep me from replacing the guts of the thing with a new copy of the object that I really wanted and a new counter. Every 10, 20, 30 uses, 
I sweep the object, I put a new one in, and I keep going. At that point, your method call, every time, you, every 20th time you call a method on this thing, or however many, you're going to sweep the object clean and start over. Obviously, that's not very good for preserving state, but if your problem is that the state is hopelessly bloated because some idiot isn't cleaning it out, that, in some cases, that might be a usable answer. But the point is, then, that the, because people see the outside part of this, you can do what you want on the inside. And is in the cleanup afterwards part is what he was pointing out. Well, and that's it. The cleanup afterwards, you know, making sure there are no leaks isn't easy. Making, you know, as he pointed out, if you if I get to global destruction at this one, I've got to go a bit further than this to make sure that the the data the DBI destroy itself is wrapped in a way that it knows to check its PID before it destroys itself. So I have to really push that one level deeper into the code. Um, so the wrappers are a good thing, but you really have to check things before you call them and clean up afterwards. And that's a lot of wrappers I've seen don't work because either they, they don't clean up properly, they only check on the way in, or they leak, which this one does. And that was it's also not bad advice in the other sense, too. So. <laughs>